and welcome to this here episode of Dear Hank and John. It's a comedy yeah, podcast about... Dear... Oh, sorry. I forgot about you, John. Usually I get to come in there. <laughs> what, what did you want to say? Forget it. <laughs> it's a comedy podcast about death where me and my brother John... We answer your questions, give you dubious advice, and bring you all the week's news from both Mars and AFC Wimbledon. How you doing, John? I mean, I was doing all right until I didn't get to say my line. Now I feel like I've been left out. <laughs> I feel like I got picked last on the playground. Actually, you know what, Hank? It's not so much a question of how I'm doing. It's a question of how I'm smelling, and the answer is fantastic. And do you want to know why? Oh, oh, sure. Yes, go. It's because I've acquired a new sponsor, Hank. Did you get 378 of something? So I... Uh, you may remember that I got 378 Snickers bars after telling the nice folks at Mars that I loved their work uh, at VidCon Anaheim. Mm -hmm. I'm no dummy. So when we went to VidCon Europe, uh, Hank, I sought out all of the sponsors whose products I enjoy, and I, I was sure to let them know about it. Uh, Are you serious? Including, Did this happen again? I'm gonna be. Am I gonna be really mad? Including Lush. What? Uh, the the makers of fine bath balls. Hank, I don't know if you know this about me, but I am a, uh, I bath, a bath person. person. I don't take yes. showers. I think showers are just <laughs> terrible. It's a form of assault. You're basically <laughs> agreeing to be assaulted by droplets of water coming at you at a high rate of speed. They're kind of like slow water bullets <laughs> is how I think of showers. <laughs> okay. So And yep. so I'm a bath taker, and I've always loved Lush's bath balls, and I'm not just saying that because they're not my personal sponsor. Um, but I was, so I met the people from Lush, and I was like, obviously, I love your work. You know, it's cruelty-free, it's organic, it's great. Uh, you make some wonderful soaps and shampoos, all kinds of stuff. I love it. And sure enough, four days later, what shows up at my office? But a metric crap Gosh, ton. dang it! Of bath balls. Uh, okay, John. I okay. Okay. So for first of all, that's yeah. I I am happy for you. I don't Thank know why you. this I keeps happening. I am so to excited. You I've already had two me. bath ball baths, and they're uh, wonderful. But I do have I do have two things to say. First of all, I have okay. received from not sponsors but fans of the pod. Two different mm -hmm. 378s. I have received mm -hmm. 378 pennies from some ne'er-do-well mm -hmm. who can go yep. find a hole to crawl inside of and be ashamed of themselves. But I have also received, and my office has been very pleased, or certain members of them, uh, from a, a bunch of fans of the pod, 378 of a, uh, a snack, candy snack thing, from Philadelphia called uh, Orion's. And they are, quote, Irish potatoes, which is a weird thing to say because potatoes are kind of already Irish potatoes, but they are, uh, they're, they're kind of like a coconut ball dusted with cinnamon and they are not my bag, but lots of people in my office like them. So we've got them up and, uh, and they're getting gone through pretty quick. So I am, I did receive that sponsorship from Orion's even though Orion's didn't pay for it. So if you live in Philadelphia and you want to try something that's the mostly coconut, check out Orion's Irish Potatoes. Uh, their candy? Question mark. Hank, you know I don't like to be pedantic, but I would just like to point out that uh, potatoes are not Irish. Potatoes are a new world food ah, that only I, came I, to I, Ireland I, after the Columbian uh, Exchange. I know, but they were very important in the history of Ireland. We think about potatoes as an Irish thing, just like we think about potatoes as an Idaho thing, even though they're also not from Idaho. I think they actually might be from Idaho. They're not. They're from South America. Only South America? Didn't they travel north? I mean, they have now. I uh, mean, potatoes well, are anyway, everywhere where now. Where is anything from in the end? Point being, Hank, Lush makes wonderful bath balls, and I've just <laughs> learned as a result of uh, this gift basket that I was given also excellent soap. Uh, that's that's wonderful. Uh, you know, I know that we're still talking about this and that it's been 10 minutes of potting already. It hasn't. But yep. I, I also, I did, uh, I did do the thing. I tried to do the thing and I reached out to Pocky on Twitter, the makers of the Pocky mm -hmm. candies. And, mm -hmm. uh, and they got in touch with me and they sent me a, a Pocky gift basket. But I feel like it didn't quite count because I was expecting 378 boxes of Pocky. And what I got was maybe 378 individual Pocky sticks. If I, I didn't really count. 
but that just that doesn't seem like it to me because it's like it's like saying like oh I got you rice sponsored your podcast with 378 individual grains of rice. That's well, uh, Hank. Here's the thing. I I mean, you're good at a lot of stuff. Obviously, like you're really good at planning and executing VidCons, which I personally appreciate because it allows me to have sponsors. But <laughs> what you're not good at <laughs> is talking to corporations and corporate representatives in a way that makes them want to send you free stuff. And like, that's why there's two of us. We have you to organize the conferences and, and run the businesses and all that boring stuff. And then we have me to, to look dead into the eyes of the person who runs Lush's marketing and say, I love your bath balls. And to say it so sincerely that they cannot help but send me amazing, high quality, A number one bath balls. By the way, it came in a, it was a huge variety of bath balls too. And I'm just having the best time. <laughs> God, I mean, I don't, can you, can you explain to me before we get to uh, questions from our listeners really quickly, why anyone uh, who has the choice to take a bath would ever take a shower? I have the choice and I take maybe a bath a year. Maybe. Oh my God. Oh my God. Like you could have a relaxing, quiet, you focused experience, or you could have these water bullets John, attack you. John, I don't have time to have a relaxing, quiet, me focused experience. And if I'm going to have one, it's going to be me alone in my office working, which I enjoy quite a lot. That's right. my bad. I bath, feel bad John. for you. I feel bad. I feel bad for people who think they don't have time for baths. Because if you don't have time for a bath, what do you have time for? Nothing. Well, In the end, if you're not taking care of yourself, you're not taking care of anybody. I but am that's... taking care of myself. I'm taking nice, relaxing baths in logistics, John. In all right, let's uh, <laughs> let's get to some questions from our listeners, Hank. All right, this one's from Emmy, who asks, "Dear Brothers Green, my name is Emmy." Ah, oh, it happened again. <laughs> and while this problem will probably not be an issue uh, for me for a few years yet, it's bothering me. I have this intense desire to see the world from Thailand to Machu Picchu to Paris. At the same time, I care deeply about the environment. I know that traveling has a lot of significant effects on the environment. So how do I keep my carbon footprint low while seeing this big world? Is it even possible? Penguins and pollution, Emmy. It's not really possible. It's not really possible. <sighs> no, I mean, I guess you could get really good at rowing. There are some <laughs> people who like row across the Pacific Ocean. Sailboats. Just get a sailboat. Just get powered yeah, by the wind. But, I mean, I feel like there's a lot of carbon that goes into the building of a sailboat. Where you get like a little kayak and you just you just row that guy across the ocean. You could see most of the world that way. Most of the cool parts are connected to the oceans. I can say that because, of course, I live in Indiana. <laughs> I mean, the, the problem is that there is a lot of ocean that is not connected to cool parts. It is just connected to other ocean. Um, That's a great point, Hank. That's a great observation. I've actually never, I've actually never been more than about three miles offshore. So, uh, but I, I, yeah. a casual glance at Google Earth does confirm uh, some of those concerns. Uh, yeah, I mean. I, I once, uh, so I, I have the same problem. I once investigated whether or not I could just like hitch a ride on a, like a barge that was already carrying a bunch of stuff. Cause like, of course, mm -hmm. bar barges are always going across the ocean and they, uh, and you can book passage on a barge uh, and you can stay on the barge along with the barge crew who makes the barge really? function. Yes. And you can get like a cabin and it's, pretty miserable and slow and it takes it takes a long time and it is not a nice experience but i it, mm. it also and also additionally uh you get that that like not great experience and it is more expensive than flying i don't know why mm. but maybe because there is like a certain type of person who does this and they are people who hate planes but also really need to get to europe a couple times a year and don't mind spending a month doing it so don't try that one. Well, uh, you could do that, Emmy. So there you go. If you have a ton of money and also a ton of time and also a desire to hang out on a container ship, uh, now we've got your passage to Europe. It's done. It's done. You can always buy carbon. Uh, you can always buy carbon offsets, and those do uh, function. It feels a little bit like cheating to me, but you. Uh, but that you know that is that you know 
the people who use carbon offsets to do good things, they rely on people to buy carbon offsets in order to do those good things, whether that's protecting forest land in South America or uh, planting trees here or, um, you know, making wind power or solar power less expensive in America. So carbon offsets are always a thing that's available, but uh, but you will always, there is no way to get around the world without pumping out that CO2. I will say that per passenger mile, uh, 747 is not that inefficient. It's just that there's a lot of miles that go into international travel. Right. I mean, I, I, but this this goes back to something we've talked about a number of times on the pod, Hank, which is that uh, there is always going to be a tension in contemporary life between values and uh, lived experience. And mm-hmm. I do not know, I have no solution for that problem. It It is complex. No. And I mean, the more the more you look at it, the more you realize, wow, I sure do like, you know, like live in extraordinary luxury while people die. And there's no yeah, real no, way I mean, to you get could around definitely that. spend all of your resources on malaria and it would be a better use of your resources than probably um, whatever Any, I'm yes. buying, mm-hmm. I- except for, of course, lush cosmetics. <laughs> Yeah, that's Which are worst. cruelty free, and everybody <laughs> everybody involved in the company is paid a living wage. Let's move on to another question from our listeners. I am such oh, a good man. advertiser, Hank. I'm just I'm just trying to. Uh, can you imagine if Diet Dr Pepper had had the good sense to get on board with me? I right. mean, no, my yeah. God, I would you have transformed about Diet Dr. their Dr. business. In, in... Instead, they're relying on this uh, this prince like uh, spokesperson called Lil Sweet. It's one of the strangest marketing campaigns I've ever mm. seen and also one of the least effective. This question comes from Natalie. Dear John and Hank, my friend and I recently had a heated discussion about whether or not Batman is a superhero. Oh, no. Why did you highlight this question? We've already had this discussion. <laughs> you highlighted it. I didn't do it. You've experienced the wrath of Batman fans, John, so you'll know uh, that they defend him to the death. However, I would argue that he isn't a superhero. I say this because, to me, a superhero is a hero who has superhuman abilities. Excellent point, Natalie. Mm. I think superheroes don't exist outside of comic books. So does a superhero have to be able to do things other humans physically never could, like fly or possess super strength, etc. Can they be people who just have great abs and some cool technology? Batman's a hero for sure, she said dubiously. I just don't think he's super. Shark repellent and sidekicks, Natalie. Great question. I would argue that Batman is not a superhero, and furthermore, that Batman is not a particularly impressive member of the Justice League. I also, I want to argue that Batman also does not exist outside of comic books. So just like first things first, take care of that point. Uh, makes it sound like Batman's real. Not actually, but there is a there is definition of superhero both in Wikipedia and whatever Google is uh, parsing. It says a benevolent fictional character with superhuman powers, such as Superman. Yep. So you're right. Batman is not not a superhero, at least according to the definition that popped up first when I googled what is yeah a superhero. and you can tell that Hank has spent a lot of time researching the question as well um I I don't think I don't think Batman's mm-hmm. a superhero I, I also I just search don't I can t- I, while I understand that I got a lot about Batman wrong when I in my video where I criticized Batman I still think you want to talk about like uh, effective use of resources I still don't think Batman is using his resources particularly effectively now I'm happy to admit that I am not either right like if I were d- distributing resources efficiently toward altruistic ends I probably would not sponsor <laughs> AFC Wimbledon but I, I also don't expect to have like comic books written about me and w- what a great guy I am. And that's the that's the thing that's always bothered me about Batman is that like in a way Batman I- I- is like a celebration of a, a billionaire j- mostly for being a billionaire. It is a weird thing. Uh and 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 I think, you know, I feel you. I feel you. And I think that we're both right on the Batman issue, John. I think that you could like that there can be nuanced positions that that seem initially contradictory, but are in fact in agreement. And that is how I feel about our Batman debate. I think we have really come to a place where it makes a lot of sense. And uh, and we understand Batman in a fuller way than uh, previously could have been possible without uh, songification by the Gregory brothers, which every argument deserves. 
Uh, I agree. They've done. They're amazing. They're they're my favorite brothers on YouTube, and that's really saying something. <laughs> okay. This is another question. It comes from Vienna, who asks, "Dear Green Brothers, if hypothetically I took a boat out into the ocean and discovered a hitherto unknown island, what steps would I have to take to claim it as my own? Is it enough?" To just land there and set up a colony in the great British tradition? Do I have to have some kind of military to defend it? Please respond, as I feel it important to have a plan for this contingency. Pimento Quarry. <laughs> Vienna. <laughs> I didn't get that until I said it out loud. <laughs> uh, I mean, I've got good news and bad news for Vienna. Uh, and the mm. bad news is that there are no hitherto unknown islands. And based on the trend in sea levels, none will be <laughs> appearing anytime soon. <laughs> I mean, the government of China would disagree with you. They seem to be very good at discovering hitherto unknown islands and setting That's up true. military bases on them. That's true. They're doing a great job with their dredges at building new islands. And if Vienna is in possession of a extremely large uh, scale industrial economy that will allow Vienna to build islands out of the ocean, a la the South China Sea or, um, or what's uh, happening in the Persian Gulf, then that's great. But if not, this is irrelevant. If so, it seems like uh, in order to claim an island as your own, uh, mostly you have to convince the international community that that island mm -hmm. is your own and you need to get them to acknowledge it, which is something that China has kind of struggled to do. Well, you know, they're still, they're still working on it. Now, John, it's possible that Vienna does have, uh, you know, a fairly large industrial economy. Is Vienna the city of Vienna? I would argue even if so, which is it's possible that the city of Vienna wrote into our podcast um, to check on the sitch with regards to colonizing hitherto unknown <laughs> islands. It's unlikely, but it's possible. Um, I would argue that the city of Vienna, based on the one day that I've spent there, is not really in a position to be building new islands. They have a lot of history to take care of just in their city. And as I recall, Vienna mm. is not on an ocean. No. In fact, but, it is in a country that does not have any access to an ocean or even a sea. There's a lake. Not direct access. I think they, I think you yeah. can get there via the River Danube in an emergency, yeah, bet, but it takes, a, you, it takes a minute. <laughs> My guess is that if you got in the River Danube, you would eventually reach the sea, correct? Um, yeah, <laughs> Hank and I are experts in geography, as you can likely tell. Uh, I am. I'm following the Danube down to the ocean right now. Oh this wait, is a long back up, Hank. River. Back up, back up, back up. There is an island. There what? is a huge island on the River Danube. Wait, where? In v in Vienna, like downtown Vienna, based on this Google map search that I'm doing right now, uh, is essentially divided by an island. Uh, let me see if there's people Ooh, on it. I see it. Yeah, it's a nice looking island. It's got, oh, it's a beautiful park. It looks like it's mostly just parkland. I don't, Vienna, I don't think you're going to have trouble claiming this park as your own, especially since there's a, <laughs> there's a festival, seems to be some kind of music festival in it called Rock in Vienna. So just the language of that would make yeah. me think that that's yours. So I think you're good on this one well, river I mean, island. I don't know if you'd be good on like a... Yeah, this... A, this river I, it's a nice looking island actually. yeah it seems to be that vienna has already claimed this river island it seems that this river island is very clearly already vienna's so vienna just you've got it right now i kind of i mean it, this makes me actually want to go back to vienna so that i can go for a jog on this massive and beautiful good. river it's good, island it's a good river island it looks very nice and no uh yeah it's a completely uninhabited um, it's just a public park it's like central park but in the middle of a river and bigger than central park Oh, well, I mean, have we have we settled that one or what? I mean, we really, we nailed it. It has a beach even. Um, for families with, in parentheses, small children, the 250 meter long family beach offers safe and child-friendly bathing fun. Why do your children have to be small? What if yeah. I... My children what are like I, what medium size. What if I want to bring my, my grown children 45 and 32? No, what if I want to bring my like medium sized seven year old child? Do I have to? Is there like a you, if you are taller than this, you can't visit the family beach thing? 
<laughs> okay, this place is actually called Danube <laughs> Island. Uh, and according to the government of Austria, which admittedly does have a dog in the fight, uh, it is a recreational paradise. Um, <laughs> for one thing, it has the world's biggest trampoline center at the Danube <gasps> Jumping Complex in the immediate vicinity of the Reichsbruch. What? Young and old jump closer to the sky and all in front of Vienna's wonderful skyline. We're talking about the world's biggest floating trampoline center with 40 individual jumping areas. Trampolining is a unique com combination of sport and fun. The adults should also have a go. Hold on. Is it outdoor? I love it. I can't wait to go to I cannot wait to go to, to the Danube Island. This place looks amazing. It's an it's an outdoor trampoline center. They also have a uh, they also have one of those like uh, high ropes courses where you learn teamwork. I mean, of course, because the Austrians, they love teamwork. Also, this this rock festival that is going on in the Google Maps version that we're looking at right now, you can camp on the yeah. island. There's a bunch of camping happening. And uh, I think I'll stay in one of Vienna's oh. uh, stately old hotels and just visit the island during the day. But yes, I understand that it, it, there's a lot of opportunities. Point being... What Hank and I really need is not like sponsorship uh, from another corporation. What we really need is visas to almost any European country that will just allow us to stay there and get that sweet, sweet health care and contribute meaningfully to society. Uh, well, I mean, yes. Uh, is that is that a kind of brand deal? Like, is that a brand deal that's available? Like, instead of getting oh like, my God. you know, what a great idea for a brand deal. Uh, Snickers bars. It's just like you come live and get free health care <gasps> in our like you now. <gasps> it's like the visa, like the brand deal visa. Um, and just it's immigration. the ultimate brand deal. Yes, you're basically you're agreeing to cast your personal brand with Australia or New Zealand or Austria or whomever it is that comes up and makes that makes the deal. That mm. would be the best brand deal ever. And I, yeah. If they came to you and they were like, listen, if you <laughs> live in Australia for the next 20 years, we will give you that sweet, sweet free health care. And in addition, maybe like a stipend, a right. small well, stipend. Yeah, just like an apartment, like hey, here, maybe on Danube yeah. Island. Get me an apartment on Danube Island. I'm the only person who lives there. Yes. And then I then I just like go around Austria and I'm like, you should vacation in Austria, Austria. It's m beautiful, mountainous. I know oh nothing about this place. There's I, salt I, mines. Are there salt it's, mines? For some reason, that's the thing I know about Austria. Yes, they're there. I think it's this place called Salzburg. Is that right? And they do have Salzburg yeah. because there was salt there. I so during the one day that I spent in Vienna, of course, all I did was go uh, to the catacombs where there's like uh, thousands of dead bodies underneath the churches. And I walked around sure, the like tunnels of and saw the like thousands of skulls and everything. And mm -hmm. uh, I was very impressed. Uh, it was it was one of the better catacombs that I've ever seen. And I definitely emerged from that catacomb experience thinking I could live here. <laughs> All right. Well, they seem to have Alps. They seem to have a good number of Alps in Austria. It just looks like a real nice place. Um, all right. So we figured it out. Uh, as long as as long as it comes with that healthcare. Um, I'm sorry. What was the question? <laughs> uh, Vienna, you already have an island. Oh God! My God, we have traveled a far distance from the original question. Let's let's move on. Let's let's recenter ourselves, Hank, mm. with another question. Focus. This one uh, comes from David, who writes, "Dear John and Hank, I live in Tooting, South London. My God, can we just stop the question for a second? <laughs> and I realize we have not answered a lot of questions today, but that's not really a place, is it? It's to it, Tooting, Tooting. Tooting? Rosiana." <laughs> is there really a place called Tooting in England? There is. There's also Tooting Beck. There's also Tooting Beck, she says. This is... Uh, 
how can a country with like 18 people have so many place names? Anyway, I live in Tooting, South London, not far from Wimbledon, yay team. I recently discovered that there is a Langston Hughes close in Brixton, which I thought you'd be pleased to learn, and I am, although I don't know what a close is. You already have a fictional space in Nerdfighteria, but would you like to have a real-life road named after you? Where would it be? What would be on it? And what would you go with? Street? Avenue? Road? Close? I guess close <laughs> is a kind of road. Lane or way? Acknowledging that even this attempt at immortality would decay in time, David. Thank you for the acknowledgement, David. Uh, would it just be called like Hank Road? Is that the idea, or it'd be like? I assume it would be like. I assume it would be like Hank Green Way, and it would be somewhere in Missoula, like somewhere in downtown oh, yeah. Missoula. Like they'd rename Fourth Street Hank Green mm -hmm. Street, and everyone would be annoyed, and they would continue to call it Fourth Street for the next mm -hmm. forty years. But eventually, people would just start they'd calling it Hank in, Green yeah. Street. Would you be into that? Uh, not really. I feel that. I feel like that's weird. I feel like roads should be named after presidents and uh, and book characters and birds. And trees like any normal place? I don't know. I'd be kind of into it. I, there's a, so there's a writer, a local writer here named Dan Wakefield. He's a great writer and just been a part of the Indianapolis literature landscape for like 50 years. And he just had a park named after him. Like mm. all that I always drive past Dan Wakefield Park. And I do. I would be cool with that. I would be cool with a park. But I would not be cool. I'd also be cool with a school. You know, that's that's super cool. If you can get a school named after you, you've really done something either right. very right or very wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, but I don't know. Yeah, I also wouldn't feel right about a road because I feel like people resent roads that are named after people. Well, I feel like people resent roads kind of like nobody really loves a road. You're not like, boy, this thing that takes me to the place I want to go is a place in itself. No, mm -hmm. it's just a place that it takes you somewhere. And for the most part, it's like sort of falling apart a little bit rubbly and it's always under construction. And it's a, ah, I don't know. I also just On feel, the other hand, like I, there I, would be children growing up on Hank Green Street. And they mm -hmm. like, like later in life when they were thinking about their childhood, they would think about Hank Green Street the way that you and I think about our childhood street, which we're not going to say the name of because it's involved in both of our uh passwords <laughs> um uh, you know <laughs> like there's something cool about like forever being a bunch of people's password because mm -hmm. they grew up on hank green street so their password's like hank green you know 61 <laughs> dang it you ruined it you ruined I've given, it pe I've given people everything they need now, now it's to over. get into my twitter our whole our whole lives are going to be taken over um i i don't know I I often feel like like, and I I know that this is kind of wrong because we need stories and we need to focus on like on the people who like we we need to connect through humans. But I always feel weird about uh, like extra recognition being focused on people um, unless they are like sort of truly remarkable. Um, I mean, even if they are, I'm like, all people were necessary. Like, the, like the people that we choose to name things after are only representations of the thousands or millions of people who worked to accomplish the thing that that person is getting credit for. And uh, that's so true. And, and I like, and I know that this is dumb, and I know that it's like a dumb, like way to see the world. And I should, and I'm wrong. But I, you know. I, I feel like recognition, like indiv individuals don't deserve recognition, humanity does. And I don't know how to solve that problem. And I don't think it's a real problem. I think I'm just a stick in the mud. Well, I mean, you know, they've done a good job of solving that problem uh, in many communist countries where they just named every everything after the workers or the proletariat. But then they started, um, you know, doing the animal farm mm. trick of uh, saying that all uh, all animals are equal, but some are more equal than others. And they started naming stuff Leningrad and Stalingrad and all that. I I I agree with you though, Hank. We should name every street. Um, thousands or millions of people contributed to this street street, and then when people need directions, they'll just be like, "What you do is you turn left at thousands and millions of people street, and then right on thousands of millions of people street, and you'll get there in no time." That's why I think we should name all the streets after birds and flowers and trees, John. All right, that's fair. <laughs> I did a terrible job of answering that question. I feel like such a curmudgeon right now. Uh, but I have another question. No, I think for it's you. nice. I think okay. it's. I think you know what, Hank. There are not enough hardcore 
uh, communists who believe that uh, everybody <laughs> should have an equal number of streets named after them. And I appreciate that you are standing up for that worldview. This question is from Linda, who asks, I totally agree with you, by the way. I mean, I think you're absolutely right that it's ridiculous that way we slather individuals in um, in praise as if individuals are the center of the human story. But go on. What's the next question? This question is from Linda, who asks, Dear Green Brothers, I'm in a wonderful relationship with an amazing guy. And uh, while I love him and his family, I harbor a dark secret. I hate his mom's cooking that would be fine, but we eat dinner with his family at least once a week where we eat the most flavorless, disgusting food I have ever had. I mean, honestly, stroganoff should not be orange. I feel like that was too much information, Linda. Now everyone knows who you are. I know that this is, yep. a, I know that this is a first world problem if I ever heard one, but I just don't know how much longer I can keep eating this food. Should I eat before and then go... Should I eat before I go over? Will they notice if I never eat in front of them? Can I ask for salt? Or is that considered rude? Boyfriends in Boysenberry's Linda. It's a hard one. That's a, it's a legit, uh, legit problem. Yeah. Well, you know, you know who had this problem was our mom. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. She did. She did. Like, like, can't like they would open the cans and empty the beets onto the plate. Yeah. Um, in my in my dad's house. Yeah, and my mom was just absolutely horrified by the way that. Uh, that my dad's family cooked. Um, I don't think there's any problem with asking for salt. I don't think that's weird at all. I mean, I, I would argue it's obviously there's a bunch of culinary problems in this family, but it's weird not to have salt on the table as an option. Like, I don't think it's weird to ask for salt. I don't even think it's weird to ask for like some Tabasco sauce so that all you taste is hot instead of having to taste the orange stroganoff. I do think yeah, what, I'm, what I'm seeing like is like a possibility of like an Assassin's Creed kind of thing where you've got instead of like your hidden blade up your sleeve, mm -hmm. you've got like a like just a bottle of Cholula and you're just like, yeah, it's like you yeah. unscrew the, t the t and it's like dribbling out through yeah. your sleeve and then you just like put the cap back on. Yeah, uh, I mean, you could bring your you know, own maybe salt. Maybe that'll work. That's I, I could totally <laughs> agree. Bring your own salt and just palm it. Um, <laughs> I, I do think that you have just like on your pocket. Your pocket is just full of salt, and you're just like reaching in there and yeah. just like a handful. <laughs> it's good. It's a good idea. There's nothing else in your pocket that you might actually get accidentally get in your food at all. The reason I think you do have to choke it down, or at least try to choke it down, is that somebody has worked hard to make food for you. And I always feel like in that situation, unless you feel like your health is at risk, you have to choke it down, or at least i that's the obligation I feel. But I have to say, just for the record, in case they're listening, my mother-in-law is an excellent cook, and I, I am very grateful to her. <laughs> never have this problem. I, I would never have that yeah. problem. Yeah. I, uh, I feel like I then immediately have to say the same. <laughs> <laughs> Hank and I are both terrified of our of our in laws. I, no, I seriously, I, I, yeah, okay. I, let's actually let's move on, Hank. Let's move on. I, I love my <laughs> in laws afraid, so much, afraid. and I don't, I don't want to ever make any trouble. We'll, this question's from never, Marvin. Never make any trouble. <laughs> Just don't make trouble. Why are you? You know what, yeah. Linda? Not, yep, why are you making go, trouble? Go, go. Stop making let's trouble. Yep, no trouble. Yep, never on. make let's trouble. <laughs> <laughs> this question comes from Morvin, who asks, Dear John and Hank, my name is Morvin. Don't worry about mispronouncing it. You wouldn't be the first. I'm a 17-year-old sixth former from England. Recently, I received an unconditional offer from the University of Nottingham to study chemical engineering. Hank, I don't know what that is, but it sounds very impressive. I've never received an unconditional offer of any kind. Except, I guess, Lush. Lush <laughs> sent me an unconditional <laughs> offer of bath balls, um, but I felt obligated to mention it on the podcast, so it wasn't that unconditional. Naturally, I was overjoyed, as unconditional offers are very rare. However, as I've been telling more people my good news, more people have been saying that I have only received an unconditional offer because I'm a girl, and the universities want mm. more girls to help with their gender statistics and engineering. I think the noise that Hank made actually would not be a bad answer to the question. Hank, do you want to just make that noise again? <laughs> Yeah, I I share your noise feeling. Um, I assumed at first that the offer was because I was just a strong candidate, but now I'm starting to question every academic achievement I've made. How much truth do you think these claims have? How do I stop second-guessing myself and reclaim my confidence? How do I maintain the validity of my achievements going into a male-dominated course and profession where my gender will always be the first thing that people judge me on? 
Oh, and just for fun, John seems terrible at pronouncing the names of English towns, so he should try saying mine. I live in... I swear to God, this uh, the word appears to be soil hole. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so wait, I, Sol I'm so Sully hole, Sully hole, Sully hole. Sully hole. So first <laughs> Sully off, hole. first off, Mor Morvin, congratulations on escaping Sully hole for the University of Nottingham. <laughs> I mean, that's got to be one of the greatest achievements in the history of the human social order. It's amazing. That's congratulations. I mean, you, you know nothing about Sully Hole, John. It Hold could on, I'm be Googling it a right place now. where everyone ends up in the greatness of great places. They have a, 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 a sport team named the Sully Hole Moors. Uh, they just, they just uh, won against Macclesfield Town. Macclesfield. Oh, I could so actually say that one. Uh, they have a soccer and team. I'm looking at it. I'm, I'm, I'm on Google Maps now. Just out, you know, it's out, it's a suburb of Birmingham, John. It has which, a, two, uh, a population of two hundred thousand, which is pretty shocking to me because I didn't even think there were two hundred thousand people in England. But um, Hank, let, let, let's answer the question. Um, I wish that I had a better answer for you. I'm sorry that that that, that your confidence has been taken away in this frustrating way, um, but. You did great. You deserve this thing. And the fact that anyone's first reaction is, I bet you don't deserve this thing, means that they suck. Is that okay to say? Not in everything, yeah, no, but in I, this I, thing. I, I, yes. I mean, they may, not, they, may not, they may not suck, but they are wrong, deeply wrong. Um, and I am really, I also, I share that feeling. It's just really... Ah, uh, it's distressing. Like, even if you had that to... thought, why would you say it out loud? Like, why because are you you're that jealous. kind of... Because you're jealous and, you, and you're resentful and you feel like uh, an opportunity that ought to belong to you has been taken away from you. But that's just dead wrong. It's just dead, dead wrong, Morvin. Like, you did not receive an unconditional offer uh, because you are a girl. You received an unconditional offer because you are obviously a very talented student who the University of Nottingham is going to be lucky to have and desperately wants to have. And you're going to be uh, a great chemical engineering student. And you are going to, I mean, yeah, it's you are going to have to live in a world in which you're, um, unfortunately, yeah, you're going to be judged by your gender. It's inevitable and it's part of the world. Um, but that's also part of that's also part of why you why you deserve this. The odds are stacked against you in so many other ways. Uh, you absolutely 100 percent deserve this. Um, Hank, can I tell you something about Sully Hall? Oh, I cannot wait because we had such a good time in Vienna. It's uh, it's the hometown of Nick Drake. Who is a, a superhero or an actor or a famous? Oh my uh, God, Nick Drake! Nick famous Drake! Famous religious? Hank, Nick Drake! Like a famous Nick, cardinal? Like a cardinal? Nick Drake was a amazing singer songwriter. Uh, also, Craig Gardner. You know Craig Gardner. Craig Hank. Gardner, the football player. He plays player? for uh, West Bromwich Albion. I was right. I yeah, he's a football right. player. The, <laughs> what about Will Grigg? You know yeah, Will Grigg. Yeah, Will Grigg, the engineer the inventor of flash nope. memory nope nope former player for uh the franchise <laughs> oh, currently uh, okay. applying its trade in milton okay. Keynes. yeah did you know that there is a uh, a health and dental center in solo hill called the bupa health and dental center bupa that's fun i didn't i didn't but the point is that more than <laughs> you rule and anybody who tells you that you don't rule because of your gender is just a yeah. jerk face, just the worst. That's, that's very disappointing to hear. I tell you what, John, Sullihull has a terrible looking roundabout. This thing is terrifying and I never want to go really? there. Wow. I can't possibly be as good as Swindon's roundabout. Swindon's roundabout is a roundabout for the You're ages. Right. In fact, every time I talk to people from Swindon, they're always like, have you seen our roundabout? <laughs> and I'm always like, yeah, yeah, no, I have. I've also been to the train museum. <laughs> so I think, I think we've done it. I feel like it. we should put the Swindon roundabout <laughs> on a t-shirt because it is impressive. Like, it's a cool thing. It's a hell of a roundabout. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, no, no doubt about it. Um, it's great. It, it, wow, I'm. I just googled Sully Hearn. Uh, Sully Hall. Nobody knows how to pronounce it. That's the point. Rosiana, how do you pronounce Sully Hall? Sully Hall. Am I saying it right? She said I'm saying it sort of right. Um, there's not a ton to do in Sully Hall. Like one of the the number seven attraction in the town is a factory tour called the Land Rover Experience, where you get to tour the Land Rover factory. Oh, eh, that's pretty cool. I'd do that. Yeah, it's got a nice park, but it's not a, it's not a River Island park. Um, let's move on because <laughs> this has not been a good episode of Dear Hank and John. I think, I think we're knocking it out of the park, dude. I don't know what you're talking about. I'm right now, I'm going to spend the entire rest of this episode clicking around the Soho roundabout, just going around in a circle on Google uh, Street View. It's great. It's beautiful. So green and lush. Yeah, actually, to go back to to go back to Emmy's question earlier, why do you need to travel anymore right. when you can just go to Google Earth? It's so good now. It is getting better and better. They just did an update. It's freaking amazing. It is. It's like going to the city. I was doing Venice yesterday, and I was like, why do we ever need to go to Venice? And also, we've got this now for when Venice doesn't exist anymore in 40 years. This is great. Yeah. Uh, well, I will say, Hank, as somebody who's been to Venice a couple times and had a total of zero fun. Uh, it might be better <laughs> on Google Street View. I did have one interesting experience in Venice, which is that I, th well, anyway, I, let's move on. Actually, I'm not going to tell that story right now. I'm not in the mood for it. Uh, <laughs> uh, I got a question from Henry. In Venice was the first time I was ever, uh, I was ever struck by ice falling from the sky. Mm. So I also went to Venice one time. That was my experience. You That's know, nice. Google Street View in Venice is more like a, it's more like Google uh, sidewalk and canal view, which is fascinating because there's no streets. Yeah, you're just not like, a lot of cars. Okay, did the did the guy with the Street View camera go down this alleyway? Oh, he did. Uh, it's pretty good. Anyway, John, what are we doing? What's this podcast about? <laughs> oh, I have, I have no idea. This question comes from Megan, who writes, uh, "Dear John and Hank." I am a 22-year-old female who has recently gotten interested in politics within the last few years. As is expected with growing up, I found that my social and political views, as well as the issues I'm passionate about, have drastically changed since graduating high school. I was wondering what the best way to navigate the dating world mm. is now that things like intersectional feminism, LGBTQ rights, and minority rights are such a strong presence in my life. I don't mind differing political opinions, but I do want to make sure I'm dating someone who also finds these things important. Should I just come out and ask future partners their feelings on all these issues first or should i abide by the never discuss politics rule thanks in advance for the most dubious of advice pumpkins and protests is Megan. there a no politics rule in dating like no oh, don't don't do that because I, I think that's a bad i idea. think that is a bad if that is a rule that is a, a bad, bad rule. rule that's a bad it depends on like i don't know what yeah. you're trying to get out of this experience but if you're trying to find somebody who you want to spend time with Maybe you should know. I mean, I don't think you should be like, so, uh, you know, I've got some litmus tests here. How do you feel about these issues? I, you know, I, but I, yeah, right. but I think that like, absolutely. It should be on the, the, the list of conversation topics. What else is there to talk about these days? Oh God, it's kind of true. I do think that there, I, I so I know a couple of married, uh, couples that wasn't a great <laughs> sentence grammatically who <laughs> have very different political views from each other. And mm -hmm. they share other values. They share like a lot of like deep core values and stuff. But I look at their relationships the way that uh, like to me, it's completely alien. I have no idea how I would navigate that if that were the case with Sarah and me, because I count on being able to turn to Sarah and say, like, can you believe this S? on a pretty regular basis. And if I couldn't mm -hmm. do that, it would be really bad for our marriage. If I was like, can you believe this S? And she would be like, I know it's awesome. That would be a big problem for me. <laughs> <laughs> like if I were like, yeah. to give you an example, if I was like, you know, I just feel like it's really weird how Vladimir Putin has become a somewhat popular figure in American political discourse. And if Sarah responded to that by saying, I don't know what you're talking about. Vladimir Putin is awesome. I, it would be a big problem for me in our day-to-day -day life. <laughs> I, I agree with you. and But that's not to say that like there are no things that I disagree with my wife about in terms of like how the world should be. 
Um, sure. But, yeah. Like, yeah. Like this. Yeah. Um, definitely have disagreements about uh, worldview and about politics and but like and and that's fine. But they're like they, you know, I think that any good relationship has to be based upon some shared values. And I think that like our un, like our belief about how the world should be, which is kind of what politics is in some ways, uh, is should definitely be on the table for discussion and that that's a really good uh good indicator for what what values people do have and you have to figure those things out so that you can have good and productive relationships with people and if you think that you have to compromise that in order to have a good relationship you don't and you shouldn't i agree uh although have you ever voted knowingly for a different like candidate than uh Catherine voted for I don't know if you guys discuss your votes but Sarah and I do and we have voted on a couple of occasions for different candidates Mm -hmm. yes Uh, we have and whenever whenever we have I have always been proven wrong by time (laughs) uh and then I have to endure a certain amount of I can't believe you voted for this jackass for governor (laughs) sort of things (laughs) Yeah, I mean, careful what you uh, say there, because because now people know that you voted for a certain jackass for governor. Well, I mean, at some point in the last 20 years, they don't know which jackass, Hank. I lived in Illinois for a while. <laughs> okay, they had a they have had a string of jackass governors. <laughs> <laughs> I've lived in Indiana for the um, last 10 years. Yeah. We've had some we've had some good governors. We've had some really poor governors, one of whom is now serving in a different office. Um uh, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I, yeah, they don't know exactly. Mm-hmm. I don't. You did. You didn't vote for that jackass governor. I don't. Think. I did not vote for um, Mike Pence. No, no. Uh, no. But yeah, but uh, it, in in the case of me and Catherine, it's always been like local offices, and it it, te- it generally turns out that like for you know for like uh, you know the comptroller of Missoula County. Uh, one person's going to be better, but not so much better that it's going to be a huge problem for anyone. It's true. It's true. <clears throat> um, which reminds me, actually, Hank, that today's podcast is brought to you by sharing values with your partner. Sharing values with your partner, it's not something that you can really buy and sell, so it's not heavily marketed, but it is valuable. This podcast is also brought to you by the technical definition of superhero. The technical definition of superheroes, it's available on, if you search on a search engine and then you're like, okay, yeah, I guess Batman doesn't count. And most importantly, this podcast is brought to you by Austria. Austria, or possibly another country with <laughs> universal health care, now offering visas to <laughs> third-rate podcasters. Hopefully. That's absolutely, I mean, this is... We have hit upon something, John, and if we can't figure out how to monetize it, then we are failures. And this, lastly, this podcast is brought to you by Intercontinental Barge Travel. Get yourself a little room on a working vessel in which people will be like, why did you make this peculiar and bad decision? All right, Hank. Um it's been quite it's been quite a journey with you. Uh, we tried to answer a question about islands. Uh, we visited both Tooting and Sully Hole, England. Uh, it's mm. been it's been it's been an adventure. Let's answer another question and then get to the all important news from Mars and Nancy Wimbledon. The stuff that people really come to this pod for. All right, John. This last question comes from Elaine, who asks, "Dear Hank and John, I work in a library as an intern, and a huge part of my job is alpha- alphabetizing authors in order for them to be shelved." Uh, I was doing this the other day, and I got to thinking, who came up with the order of the alphabet? Is yeah. there any particular reason that A is first and Z is last, etc.? I can somewhat understand that we need a specific order of the alphabet. Somewhat. You're a librarian. You obviously need to. You need that. But I cannot fathom how they decided what letters come in what order. Any answers, dubious or not, would be appreciated. Memento Mori, Elaine. Nobody knows. Yeah, I mean, this is the second question that we are answering today that we have discussed previously in a Vlogbrothers video, which makes me think we have made too many Vlogbrothers videos. But I made a video about this called Why is the Alphabet in Alphabetical Order? And the answer is nobody knows. And in fact, the weird thing about this is that the alphabet has been in alphabetical order for longer than any individual word has existed. 
Yeah, also that the alphabet has sort of been in alphabetical order since before it was the alphabet, like since before it was the English alphabet. So, oh yeah. Nobody yes, knows. Before so for longer than English has existed, for longer than any language currently existing on earth has existed. Yeah. That's weird. What a cool like weird thing and it is like somebody did that. Yeah, it kind of points to the possibility, and this is something that I think about a lot and that really makes my head hurt, but there's a relationship between thought and language that is so deep and profound that you really kind of can't separate the two of them. Like, thought without language is very different. It looks very different. It feels very different, I think. And the few people that we've you know, it, it encountered who don't have language and who later acquire mm -hmm. it in adulthood, mm -hmm. uh, talk about thought differently. Mm -hmm. And it's just weird and overwhelming. And I'm just grateful for the alphabet. Yeah. Well, I mean, to me, it, it's, uh, it's indicative of the great lineage of, of humanity. Like these are things that, that continue and that progress and that like, you know, they're just a useful tool and they were useful every single generation for, you know, since language existed. And so we have continued to use that tool and had no reason to refine it. And so we still have this, this tool that is the order that, that the letters come in that stretches back pretty much, you know, farther back than we can see. And, uh, and whoever did that, you know, whatever group of people did that, they had a tremendous impact on you know humanity over the years and we will never know who they were uh, or what they were thinking and that's fine and great yeah it's also why we need to name every street thousands and millions of people street <laughs> <laughs> uh hank before we Everybody get to uh we got a couple great, corrections great before we get to the news from mars and afc wimbledon oh, uh God, first off uh, we've talked a lot of smack about uh russia on this podcast, apparently. And Natalia wrote in to say, Dear Green Brothers, you've probably heard about the mass protests that happened all over Russia last week. My family and I live in Russia and are strong supporters of the Russian opposition. And I've always been frustrated with the fact that people outside of Russia often judge the whole country by its leader. I'm not saying that no one in Russia supports Putin and despises the liberal values that most people in the U.S. believe to be essential, like freedom of speech. I'm not sure that most people believe them to be essential, Natalia, but your point is well taken. But there are people <laughs> like me and my friends that desperately want change and spend a lot of time trying to make it happen. I see so much surprise over the fact that there were mass protests in Russia, yet hundreds of people have been doing so, so much in the last couple of years. Um, I just wanted, uh, and she signed off, I really want to be free, Natalia. And I just wanted to underscore that because it's very easy to imagine uh, countries monolithically, and it is a mistake. Uh, and the people who are fighting for a freer Russia are doing so in at great risk to themselves and to their families. And um, and they are uh, real heroes in a way that uh, I cannot imagine. So I just wanted to read that. And then I also wanted to have a couple quick corrections, Hank. Um, most importantly, uh, from Austin. Do you want to read this one? Right. Yeah, I mean, it seems, it seems dubious to me, but I am going to read it. It's a bit of a shift from the last correction. Yeah. John, John just highlighted one word on, in this uh, list, and it made me laugh. Uh, so anyway, yeah. uh, in a recent podcast, a, quote, sponsor told the listeners to pee anywhere except in a toilet. My correction is, please don't. I have a very close friend who made the terrible mistake of peeing on a bonfire, they felt safe being several feet back. However, the intense flames superheated his urine stream and burned the inside of his urethra. Yeah, that does seem please, a little please, dubious. Please. I don't know how that would happen. Like, yeah, it's, I don't think that it's, that's not that good of a conductor of, of heat. Just a stream of pee, I don't think would be. But I can see getting a burn. I can see like the steam flashing back and getting a burn around that area. But I have a hard time seeing how the pee is going to get so hot to burn the inside of the urethra. But I'm not saying you're wrong. Austin, did you I go to like the to hospital with this friend? Or is this a story that your friend told you? Because mm. my feeling is maybe like unless you were in the hospital room where the diagnosis occurred, I think that there may uh, have been a little bit of exaggeration in this story. And I say that as somebody who's pretty experienced in the field of exaggerating stories. 
<laughs> I do want to say that there are lots of dangerous places to pee where you shouldn't pee. For example, we were just in Amsterdam yep. where a number of men are found dead in canals every year. Yep. And the vast majority of them have their flies down because they were peeing into the canal. Yep. And then they fell in. And the canals have sheer walls that are very hard to climb out of. Yeah. Uh, Don't get drunk and pee in a canal in Amsterdam. Unless... That's a great Unless advice. Unless there Hank. is just a there is a murderer who is going around unzipping people's flies and then pushing them into the canals. That's a and really good. Uh, that's a this. really good premise for a mystery novel. But I suspect that. Um, Je- do you want to know what the title of that novel is, John? I uh, desperately because is it called? Um, because of- but you're a horse. <laughs> what? <laughs> As a throwback to a very old episode of the pod. Yeah. yeah. No, John, uh, this was not my joke, but I can't remember who made this joke. Yeah. Uh, but it was made on in, on the canal in Amsterdam at VidCon, Jack the Zipper. <laughs> but what were we talking about? Okay, Hank, it's time to get to the news from Mars and AFC Wimbledon. Uh, let's start with the news from AFC Wimbledon. Hank, AFC Wimbledon have gone on an amazing, amazing run. And by amazing, amazing run, I mean they have not <laughs> scored in one, two, three, four games. They have they've scored zero goals oh, in four games. And their last two games against Peterborough and Swindon Town were both nil-nil draws, which is very impressive in one sense. We haven't kept that many clean sheets this year, but a slightly less impressive in the sense that, um, uh, you know, we haven't scored in mm, <laughs> 360 minutes of football, which is a lot. <laughs> Even for yes, soccer, even for soccer, that's not enough goals. <laughs> yeah, that sounds that sounds like a lot of sitting around uh, for this. Well, for the I mean, you know, the, the, the Wimbles. The only the question wombles. at this point is, will the Wombles somehow finish above the franchise currently playing its trade in Milton Keynes uh, in the in the end of season table? Mm-hmm. Currently, mm-hmm. uh, kind of, d- we're down by two points with two games to ah. play. Two games left uh, in the season. Yeah. So it's possible, but uh, there mm-hmm. is no chance of being relegated. Uh, Wimbledon are now mathematically unrelegatable, and that in and of itself is a massive success for this season. Um, being Getting promoted to League One this year and being able to stay in League One is awesome. So it's been a successful season, even if the last four games have featured zero goals. Well, John, uh, some folks at Purdue University have created a device, and the point of the goal of this device is to basically have a small scale, simple food processing system that can take things like soybeans or other or, or grains and uh, and make it into food more like food than just the soybeans. So like we take soybeans and we make a lot of stuff out of it, but we usually need very large scale equipment to do that to like make soybean oil. Uh, from soybeans and then take whatever the pro- like end result of that is and then you take all that stuff that isn't the soybean oil and you make stuff out of that. Um, so this is all very important uh, if you're thinking about how to like set up a group of people to survive on another planet for a substantial amount of time. Uh, it's ideal if they could be taking raw materials and creating foodstuffs that aren't just those raw materials. And so these Purdue University scientists made this thing that separates uh, the stuff using like heat and and uh, vacuum and et cetera, a bunch of different techniques, separates oils from grains or from soybeans or other things and, uh, and, and creates uh, stuff that can be then used for the manufacture of other kinds of food. Now, they did this, and it's sort of like a first test of the kind of thing that it would need to, like that that NASA would need. It's a, it's too big, it's too heavy, but it's uh, it's definitely the first uh, thing of its kind. It's, it's, uh, I would say that like the basically the size of a, of a, of a microwave oven, which is much smaller than how you would normally be like the kind of equipment you would normally need to to do this kind of stuff. It's not the shape of a microwave oven. It looks for all intents and purposes like a uh, like a piece of a lawnmower. But um, but it turns out that this technology is also very useful in places where uh, we are still doing a lot of manual labor. And when I say we, I mean humans, in order to convert uh, food it, it, into things that can actually be eaten. So you might grow stuff and then you like have to slam it together and then boil it to make a porridge that's actually edible. 
and that's a lot of like a lot of labor goes into that. And in places where um, in places where like you know you now live in a city, but still you're in a, in like somewhere in uh, the developing world you don't have time to do all that labor to get your food ready to eat. And so oftentimes people then purchase food that has gone through an industrial, um, you know, alteration somewhere far away and then has to be shipped back. So that food might've started out in the country where you are, gone all the way to another country and then come back processed. And then you have to pay for all of that. And so there's, there's, they're realizing now that they could be using this kind of technology to have smaller scale distributed food processing um, that uh, was designed originally for NASA and for Mars, but could actually be used to help people uh, turn the food that they grow in the place where it's grown into uh, the kind of foodstuffs that people would want to consume and uh, and help in like enliven those economies and also free up some time that people would otherwise be using to prepare their food, which I thought was pretty cool. Yeah, and you know that's happening in my uh, home state of Indiana. That's great to hear. It's nice. And you know, by the way, you know who the president of Purdue University is? No idea. Former Indiana Governor Mitch, what's his name? Mitch Daniels. Mitch Daniels. Hmm. There you go. So. Uh, just a little bit of information for you. That's all being headed up by Mitch. The the, the billboards for him always said, my man, Mitch, which I just thought was. <laughs> so, thanks. Thanks, my so man, Indiana. Mitch. Indiana. But yeah, thank you, Mitch, um, for providing more food possibly to the world and certainly to the future people on Mars. Hank, what did we learn today? John, we learned that there is no, no politics rule when it comes to that swiping dating thing that the kids are doing these days. We learned, uh, of course, that there is a place in England called Tooting. We learned that Danube Island is a recreational paradise without the largest outdoor trampolining available on planet Earth. And of course, we learned that if you really cannot stand your mother-in-law's cooking, just hide a couple salt packets in your palm. (laughs) Get really good at magic (laughs) and then use your magic skills to salt your food. This is the first step one in most Dear Hank and John answers. Get really good at magic. (laughs) (laughs) All right, John. Thanks thanks for talking. (laughs) Such, such, that's such good advice, Hank, so important as step one <laughs> always get good at magic hank thank you for potting with me we are now going to make this week in ryan's our new uh podcast uh which is available at our patreon it's like a five to ten minute bit where we talk about a ryan every week if you go to patreon.com slash dear hank and john you can find out more and get free information on lots of uh various things related to the pod but uh thanks for potting with me you can email us at hank and john at gmail.com that's the place to send questions uh and dear hank and john is produced by rosiana hals rojas and sheridan gibson is this what you were going to do john yeah do that our editor is nicholas jenkins victoria bongiorno is our head of community and communications and our music is by the great gunner rolla and as they say in our hometown don't, don't forget, forget to be awesome to be awesome sorry i didn't i didn't kill that one but to be fair you didn't do very well on the intro <laughs> <laughs>